Good morning, everyone. My name is Steve Sincula, and I'm the CEO of AgriSecure. I want to thank everyone for joining this morning's webinar. Uh, before we get kicked off, I just wanted to cover a, uh, a few items or a few housekeeping items. One, uh, we do want to make this a discussion as much as we can throughout the presentation, and so there's a few ways for uh, everyone to participate uh, in the discussion. Uh, we have a Q&A box uh, as well as a chat function, so if you have questions throughout the webinar, Please feel free to put the, the questions in, your questions in either of those, and I'll watch those throughout and raise them at a, at a time that's appropriate. Um, or we will allow you to unmute yourselves. I think most are muted as they come in uh, and take a break for questions throughout the discussion. Uh, so feel free to raise your questions. We really want to make sure that we get the most out of our time together. Uh, in terms of today's discussion topic, we're, this is the first in a series of webinars, so this one is uh, really targeting what does the transition process look like from going from conventional to organic row crop production. And so we're covering a lot of the basics uh, around transition, uh, what the process is, and what is required to be certified for organic production. Uh, I'd encourage you to, again, ask any questions you have throughout and also consider participating in additional uh, webinars that we'll be holding over the next several weeks that will build upon this event. With that, um, again, I am Steve Sincula. I'm the CEO and co-founder of AgriSecure. And uh, joining us and leading the, most of the discussion today will be Pete Kaputska. And Pete, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, thank you, Steve. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> my name is Pete Kapuska. I am an account executive with AgriSecure. Um, my trade territory that I work is Western Iowa, Western Minnesota, and the Dakotas primarily. Um, I do have an extensive background in agriculture. I grew up on a farm west of Fort Dodge, Iowa. I've uh, got my ag biz degree from Iowa State. Uh, spent a number of years uh, farming, um, six years actually. Uh, after college and then went into the agribusiness world in both co-ops, seed companies, um, some startups and adjuvant nutritional companies. Um, working with uh, AgriSecure these last uh, couple of years now, starting my third year, I um, got the bug to get back into farming and so I started Red Pill Organics and currently have ground over in New Glarus, Wisconsin that I'm farming. So I hope that uh, my, my perspective is relevant to what you're thinking about. I ran through the numbers, ran through the same processes um, that you probably did in coming here today. So with that, let's, uh, let's dig into things. We do have an agenda we're gonna try to, to maintain uh, going throughout. Um, we do obviously wanna hit heavy on transition, but there's other items um, involved in uh, what this transition process uh, leads into. Um, so we'll start First, start with that opportunity. Um, as many of you know, there is a good marketplace out there for organic crops, and it is a market that is rewarding um, compared to um, other conventional markets uh, that are there. And Steve, yes, there we go. thank you. So yeah, as you can see from this chart, uh, we do have a, um, a charting of both the conventional and the organic um, crop prices uh, since 2008. Now, these are the market prices. They do not uh, reflect profitability, so there's no cost factor in there. Uh, you can see that these two lines, though they somewhat mirror each other, they don't trade in lockstep. And there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, when you think about conventional commercial corn and soybean production, uh, they tend to be very commoditized, um, very much um, a function of supply in the marketplace that tends to hold price down relative to organics. Um, organics is very much a demand driven by the consumer market. Uh, currently today, we import over 70% of the soybeans that go primarily into feed rations and then for, ch and for uh, chicken meat. Uh, close to 30% of the corn uh, that is required for organic states is imported as well. 
So as we look at today's current economics, um, when you look at the fact that we're using up all our domestic production of both corn and beans on an annual basis and importing, that this market is not gonna be going away. And so as you think about transitioning, you can be very sure that when you get into those organic production years, the market is gonna to continue to reflect the reality that it is a valued crop and that it'll be uh, uh, something in strong demand. So to be clear, when we get started here, there's a couple of things um, we need to make sure we understand completely as we get going. And that is the basic two parts of what we're gonna talk about today with a heavy emphasis on transition. So transition is that period of time that is necessary to reach the stage of being considered certified organic. Um, the transition period starts with the last date of a non-approved substance applied to a field or the taking over of management of that field without an affidavit stating that previous um, application occurred. Uh, during the transition process, as simply as I can state it, you farm with all the organic methods necessary to be organic, but you're unable to sell into that marketplace. So you're selling into the other markets that are out there. So if you're transitioning with corn, you're gonna be selling into the commercial conventional corn market. Um, same with soybeans, same with other cropping systems. So you are farming with those same methods, with those same protocols necessary for organic. Um, after that 36 months plus one day, with everything being completed properly, you are able to get that organic certificate and then that allows you to reach those organic markets and um, capture that premium with the continued documentation and the, con the continued following the protocols that are set out by the NOP, National Organic Practices, according to your OSP. So as we think about transition, a number of things uh, come into play. Um, it is a challenge from an economic point of view because you are doing that additional work without recovering the rewards. So the economics of a transition are very important. Certainly you wanna make sure that you get a fair return in terms of money, but then also keeping in mind that a successful transition sets up a very successful organic program. So during that process, you wanna keep one eye on economics, um, one eye on managing, and then certainly the agronomics come in play. Um, typically when I sit and, and get an opportunity to talk to people about organics, um, it usually comes down to two big things that are in their mind. Um, one of them, how do I manage weeds? Um, certainly that is a consideration. And I think throughout everything we do in the transition and organic process, weed management and weed control um, strategies are an important part of just about every consideration of every management decision we make. Uh, the other part is, where do I start or how do I get things going? And I think that's a, a big part of where AgriSecure comes in. But, but be keeping in mind that all these things are moving at the same time. So you've got to keep your eye on one thing, but be wary that there's other things out there. They're going to impact things both in the short term and in the long term. So when we talk about the uh, National Organic Program, we talk about certain protocols that are involved. Uh, I laid some of these out earlier. Um, the biggest thing I think most people um, need to understand is that from a fertility point of view, uh, management is typically done with manures um, or raising your own uh, fertility with cover crops. Um, there are some supplemental products that are out there from a fertility point of view, especially when you come into approved products for um, trace and micronutrients, uh, but those are typically expensive and their performance is not always a, a solid return on the investment. Um, you do, in the practice of being certified, make sure all your seeds that you are purchasing are either um, conventional without treatments or with treatments that are approved, or they are in fact organically raised seeds. 
Um, and that includes cover crops too. So you wanna make sure that your cover crops have the appropriate seed coating and they are crops that are raised in an appropriate fashion. Um, insurance is an interesting component. I am not an insurance agent. Uh, we do have people we can recommend uh, because insurance is a big part of risk management in the organic um, world. So you wanna make sure that you're in alignment with your production and your crop insurance so that you're giving yourself as much revenue and coverage protection as you can. Um, one thing too, um, paperwork and documentation is a huge part of organics. Um, I know there's a lot of people that get really excited about organics, that they wanna look at different rotations, that they wanna look at different um, agronomic uh, management uh, crops. Um, but for most people, I think it's a real surprise to them when they realize that organics is, if nothing else, an equal part of that agronomic production, that agronomy production of a crop. The other equal part is all the traceability that's involved and documentation that's necessary to show a chain of custody. That's, that is all that information all the way through the process, going back to that start of uh, transition to that end user when you finally sell that bushel of crop. Someone can come in from the outside and pull the whole book open, so to speak, and see exactly how things have been handled. So one without the other is not organic. You have to have both of those components together. And throughout the process of certification and disclosure of information, it becomes very apparent. I think that's where most farmers uh, have their, their weakest uh, spot. And of course, you do have the opportunity to continue to work with the government through the regular government programs or um, any kind of a program that's out there for the commercial operations. Um, those also are available for you on the organic side. So even though I'm raising organic crop this year, I went to the FSA, put my disclosures together um, for certification, including my um, farm plans and my modules and all the basically all the information I needed for certification so that the USDA and the local FSA office has all that information. So when we talk about that 36 months plus, 36 months plus one day, what does that really look like in terms of a cropping system? For most farmers, it actually amounts to two years of cropping and then that third year becomes the organic crop. So, most guys this last year might've put out a fungicide or insecticide on their corn and soybean acres. So that would technically start the clock in terms of that 36 months. So let's say the 1st of July, you went and sprayed that product in 2020. So you would have a transition year 2021. You would have a second transition year of 2022. And if you harvested that crop in 2023 past the 1st of July, if you've got all your documentation in place, if you've done all the protocols properly, you'll be able to sell units off of that farm as certified organic. So it's possible you could do corn and then harvest that corn in 2023 in, in November, but you could also raise winter wheat planted in the fall of 2022, harvest that the first part of July of 2023. Or you could do alfalfa if you've got a good market for organic alfalfa. Your first two cuttings maybe of 2023 would be conventional, but your third cutting, having been 36 months plus one day past that previous date of chemistry, that would be then considered an organic crop. So looking at your own individual circumstances, you can start to see how this transitioning process can feel a little bit shorter than three years. So a big part of what we do at AgriSecure is, is help people through the economics. Um, our company is a company founded by farmers who are looking for better ways of doing things. And when it came to organics, trying to do things the best way possible. So as we work with individuals to develop plans, we are always keeping in mind the economics. And I'll also mention understanding how the weeds play into that as well. So when you think about those two years of transition, I tend to think about year number three as that year that you want everything to be perfect in that operation. So year three tends to set going backwards years one and year two. 
So as you start thinking about that transitioning process, you want to make sure you've got things in place in terms of systems and protocol, in terms of equipment, in terms of people. Um, you want to get um, uh, your people in the finance end of things, your people in the insurance end of things. I would say where possible and where necessary, uh, landlord involvement is a big part of that too. So there's, there's a lot of things that, that kind of go into having a very successful transition and the economics um, are part of that. So. We do have tools at AgriSecure that make that easier. Uh, when you get an opportunity to sit down with the account executive in your area, we can start to formulate plans uh, populated with information from Iowa State in terms of custom rates and then best estimates of where we are with um, either transition crop pricing or organic crop pricing. Um, so you can start to lay out things in a, in a measured fashion. Um, I think Certainly one thing about uh, organics, uh, you can see by looking at this snapshot of a five-year plan, um, it's typically a lot more planning than what you're gonna see in a conventional operation and a lot more strategizing and being nimble to make changes if the market tells you there's a better system out there. Um, but in running through those numbers, we have tools that can help you make the best decision that can show ranges of profitability as you can see in the panel on the right that as you see a market price for organic corn move up, uh, it takes less bushels to get to a break even. And I think that's really one of the important things to think about um, from my perspective, and I think the people that I work with perspective with organics, um, and it works the same with transition too, that during that process, you wanna do things on your operation that can keep your break even as low as possible so that you put yourself in a position to have the good things happen. If you're overcapitalized for machinery, if you're putting out inputs that are not showing a really strong return on investment, that just makes the economic uh, situation and stress harder to manage. And it does lead to decisions that aren't always the best. Um, so I think one of the things we do at, at AgriSecure, having worked with customers um, that are experienced in agriculture and, and organics, is to help people manage those costs to a low level. And then over time, start to integrate things to get more return on those investments. Um, we've certainly made as a collective group of, of owners in the company, a number of mistakes that have been uh, personally expensive. I know Bryce, o, Bryce Earlbeck, uh, one of the founding partners talks about uh, a million dollar education that he's had in organics of all the things that sounded like good ideas um, that when it actually went into practice, uh, became things that uh, you regret doing. And I think that's one thing we tend to do too, is try to pe keep people from making those kind of mistakes in thinking um, and help keep people in a path that gives them the best chance for success. So when we think about that transition period and looking at that year three, certainly year three, we wanna have perfect conditions, we want to have the best potential for that crop, because in a three-year scenario, it's likely that third year is going to be the financial home run for the other two years. So in, earlier, we looked at the, uh, the budgeting for a five-year um, cropping system. Those first two years are pretty lean in transition. So when you think about that uh, third year, um, the organic um, boost of income help subsidize those two previous years. But in order to get that best yield that third year, you've got to be looking at weed management strategies. You know, weeds are one thing that will reduce yield tremendously um, and uh, very quickly if they're out of control within your system. So transitioning with crops that help manage weeds or using practices that manage weeds um, are essential, I think, in getting to a successful long-term organic farmer. Um, before you come into organics, you want to make sure that things are corrected in the field that you can, whether that's a nutrient issue, whether that's a pH issue. Um, drainage in certain areas can be an issue as well. So having a plan and strategy, if you aren't addressing those prior to organics, there are some opportunities within that transition to do some things like tiling after a um, short crop. So coming in, planting oats, um, 
after your oats are harvested, you're able to come in somewhat in an out of season price, have somebody come in and do drainage work on that farm and therefore put you in a better spot when you get to um, that third cropping year. Um, you wanna be thinking about cropping systems and sequences because you certainly cannot go continuous corn in organics. You have to have a diversity of rotation. And we find that the successful people that are out there that are doing organics are having a robust system. They're having a system that challenges weeds to keep up. If you think about your conventional corn and soybean rotation today, you're planting at roughly the same time, treating things with herbicides and harvesting at roughly the same time too. Now the weeds have figured this out. So their growth pattern is such that when we get to harvesting, they're mature. So if you're able to shift that pattern by planting corn one year, coming back the next year with a, um, a maybe seed down rye in the fall, harvest rye in July, now you're getting those weeds before they have a chance to mature. Alfalfa certainly is a great way to, to manage weeds in that you're continually cutting and removing that vegetative cover. So annual weeds can be managed very effectively in an alfalfa system. So going back to that weed management, if you're doing things right from a nutritional point of view, if you're doing things right with a rotation point of view, you're chipping away at weed issues as well. So most everything we can do in terms of a management decision is going to have an impact either positively or negatively on that one thing that tends to drive people crazy in organics, and that's managing weeds. So Pete, I'm going to jump in with the question we received. Uh, it, it was asking, you know, one of the challenges in organic production when you're moving away from herbicides is that you're moving into a system that increases the amount of tillage, which can work against soil health. So I, I think addressing that is, is one topic we might want to address quickly. And then the question was, uh, any long -term, are there any long-term no-tillers no in organic? Uh, that we've seen be, and I'll put in, we've seen be successful. Okay. Yeah, first of all, <clears throat> in, in sitting down with your account executive or, or starting to think about organics, um, not every acre, not every situation is perfect for organic production. So when you talk about um, tillage and you may be thinking about, well, I've got a, a field that's got C and D slope to it, that may not be the prime candidate for organic production. Um, you are going to be doing tillage you, as, a weed, as a way to manage weeds. You can reduce it. You can use implements that do less disturbance, but you've got to have enough disturbance to, to change the weed pattern more than anything else. <clears throat> so maybe that field isn't the place to start or the place to go aggressively with um, corn and soybeans. Maybe it's a field that as you get into organics um, and through a transition of maybe alfalfa that you dedicate that more towards um, small grains if you've got a good small grain market in your area. Um, so it's important to stay flexible and not get locked in. Um, as far as the amount of tillage or trying to go no-till, um, there are some people that are trying different strategies um, with different tools that are out there in the marketplace. For example, um, there are some people that are doing flaming as a way to manage weeds um, pre-plant and then early plant. And then once that canopy is established under the canopy, um, it can be done. To me, that's an advanced management strategy. It, it, it wouldn't be my first go-to for that reason. Um, there again, keeping it to the basic level, um, seed, manure, sunlight, um, you know, your fertility, get that basic program in place, manage it well, and then start looking at things that I guess I'd say are more on the exotic end of things. I know for myself, though, having um, just kind of talked about that, when I was farming earlier in my career, I was no-tilling with ridges, uh, where I was building a, a berm every 30 inches uh, with my cultivator that was about six inches tall. So as the corn would get close to um, canopying in where I couldn't cultivate, I would cultivate fast enough with enough aggression 
to move dirt up around that plant to bury weeds, but then also leave myself um, a hill that during the next crop year when I would plant soybeans, with the planter attachment, I would shave that ridge off and plant into a warm black um, soil. So as I look forward to cropping in my organic system, to me, that's an audible that I'm ready to pull when I get the opportunity to have a corn crop followed by a soybean crop within my rotation. I've seen it done with a couple farmers um, on, on a large and a small scale both, and I think it has merit. Um, but there again, if I didn't have that experience early on, I don't think that'd be something I'd want to jump into right away. So long story short, no-till does present some challenges within um, uh, within the organic world. Um, there are some people that are having some success with it though. And, and I'm just going to jump and add a few things in there real quick on that question because it is one there's a lot of discussion around. Um, you know, so from an agro-secure perspective, uh, one thing that we work with uh, with new members we'd recommend with anyone is again starting with the basics and then working up to more advanced practices. Um, thinking about tillage not just in a single crop year, but across your crop rotation and trying to minimize uh, both the amount of tillage and the amount of soil disturbance as best you can. And that can be by integrating different types of crops into your rotation. So, for example, one of our founders, Bryce Earlbeck, uses alfalfa as one of his rotation crops in organics. Um, it doesn't necessarily fetch a, a strong premium. Uh, from a sales perspective, but when he looks at his long-term crop rotation and having that built into the system and the benefits of it, it makes a lot of sense for him. And then there's a lot of innovation happening around different types of uh, cropping systems for a specific crop. So whether it's uh, planting soybeans into rye and then rolling the rye to reduce the amount of tillage but still manage wheat weeds, or thinking about intercropping, where we did a, a webinar uh, that's online at our YouTube channel, if you're interested, as a way to also reduce the amount of tillage in that crop year, as well as increase the diversity of plant species in the field that year. So there's different approaches, but we have not seen um, it be successful at scale um, uh, in situations that we've been encountered with. So we're really focused on how do we minimize tillage uh, across the crop rotation to get the benefits of moving away from herbicides and other chemicals that also have a negative impact on the soil biology um, and, and really capturing as many of the benefits from organic production for the soil as we can. There's a follow-up question that says, do some organic producers use hand weeding as part of weed management? So in, in terms of row crops where we really specialize, the only situations where we've seen hand weeding uh, be applied is in soybeans, and that's typically as a rescue uh, approach. So soybeans tend to be a more challenging crop uh, if you're just planting them on their own from a weed management perspective, and so you can get situations where uh, you need to bring in a group of walkers, uh, and that's typically done by hiring out um, that activity. And it's fairly expensive, so it's only really need, used um, as needed and kind of a preventative measure for future years. So by the time you've gotten there, it's taken away some of the yield from that year, but it's really about managing weeds for the following crop years and making sure that weed seed bank doesn't take off too much. Um, you know, there's been some discussion around folks saying, you know, could we hire a local local kids to help with weeding. We've heard some situations where that's been successful, but unfortunately, more than not, uh, the quality of, of work uh, and the excitement for going out and weeding fields in local communities isn't there anymore. Uh, and so they've been forced to bring in uh, weeding crews that do this professionally. And again, that can be fairly expensive. So, uh, I, say, uh, Pete. I know that's um, one of the things we talk about quite a bit, um, even kind of roundtabling it to decide when we're in a situation where we're putting a rotation where it's possible or even likely that we have walkers. Do we take a step back then and look at our rotation as a way to eliminate that weed bank by putting in another small grain, by putting in another year or two of alfalfa? And 
as you start to look at a rotation and think beyond just that immediate one year, um, it does tend to make decisions a little bit easier about how to manage things like soybeans. And just the idea upwards of two, $250 an acre for hand walking, um, that's typically 10 bushel of soybeans. So uh, organic soybeans at a $20 per market price. So it is a big commitment if you're putting yourself in a planned situation of needing or wanting to have walkers. Now there's some other products out there. There's weed zappers. Uh, I think flamers have an interesting uh, point too, but we can get to those a little bit later in the discussion as we go through some more slides. So one final comment, and then we will move on to make sure we keep moving forward. But Linda, uh, I believe, uh, who's with Rodale, uh, mentioned that Rodale developed a roller crimper where, uh, the, the, you, where you terminate a crop and then you can plant uh, the crop into that mulch. Um, we have members in our, our network who are doing that on soybeans, and so they're either planting it into the crop once it's been terminated, and some are actually experimenting with planting into the crop before it's terminated, and then crimping, crimping when uh, the soybeans are still at a stage where they won't be damaged too much by that. Um, so there's a number of different techniques, and anything like that, uh, one of the things that you know, Pete mentions, you need to go back to your field, because we've seen some situations where uh, the field conditions really work well with a, uh, a crimper, and other situations where the crimping can be less effective and then create other issues. And so that's something where um, just because somebody's doing something successfully uh, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for your farm, or you need to really dig deep and understand the details uh, around what situations it works in and where it may not work and um, how does that apply to your farm. I would say one thing with crimping too, that if, if that is your strategy and plan for managing <clears throat> managing residue and weeds within a system, you better have some good experience, um, not just the science of it, but the art of doing it. Because if you don't terminate that stand, there's very few options going forward to manage the rye that you haven't crimped or weeds in that situation. So it may work. It, it, statistically can work a number of times, but when it doesn't work, it can be very painful. So kind of moving back to things, we, we talked about the rotation as being a big part of managing weeds, but then also managing the whole structure of organics and how the diversity and stretching out of that rotation can give you more options and more security in, in dealing with things as they come up. Um, Planning uh, field by field is important. Um, I think one of the things that uh, reinforced that to me was a year ago or two years ago now, we had um, an area in the Western uh, Corn Belt that had a lot of prevent planting. And having a detail of where we were currently at with um, our rotation and looking forward um, with the rotation, we were able to make some very good decisions about how to manage on the fly in those situations. Had we not put a plan together, had we not thought about a rotation, it could have been very stressful and we could have put ourselves behind the eight ball trying to push something that really didn't have a good fit. And that kind of leads us to that last point of a support plan. Um, I think that is probably one of the unsung heroes that we tend to have at AgriSecure. Um, there is a lot of information out there on organics, a lot of anecdotal, it works for me, it doesn't work for me kind of things. Um, because of our network of people, we've become a clearinghouse of management practices and we're working to distill those management practices into best management practices to share with the people that are a part of our group. So having that information, having it actionable and having it um, based on experience is important. But it's also important to have people on your team as you're looking at going to organics that have the credibility, that have the experience uh, to not just have an idea, but have an idea that makes sense. One of the planning tools I think that uh, we're able to use as we gather all this information for certification, there's other ways of um, using that information to manage things. This um, field work grid, one of the 
interesting look at is as we think about conventional farming, um, we're able to put a lot of activity into April and very little into May, June, July, and then we're into harvest. There's just not a lot. But when you start to look at organics and start looking at how many trips and how many passes across that field, you're starting to see that it means you have um, a little more commitment to uh, timing, a little more commitment with the right um, pieces of equipment at the time. I would say too, as you're looking at that um, primary time frame of April, May, and June in organics, um, those are the big return on investment activities that go into the farm. They are also the big time drains when you also have to do the certification and documentation process. Uh, most of that tends to come to a head in those three or four months. So as you're thinking about your crop planning system, as you're thinking about your allocation of people and labor, if you're thinking about a rotation that maybe doesn't put everything in corn one year and everything into soybeans the next, as you start to spread that out. Also remember that you've, you've got to allow time for the documentation and the inevitable out of the blue phone calls about correcting or cleaning something up or clarifying something. Um, and I think that's one of the strengths of, of working with AgriSecure is that we're able to take that information that we've gathered throughout the season and allow the account executive to focus on those things while you focus on getting things done in the field. And certainly that time of the year, if you're thinking about, I have to get paperwork processed and, and in, or I need to plant corn, um, those are very expensive hours when you're not out there planting corn when you need to. Yep, and I'm gonna just jump in and reinforce a few messages on this. So from a capacity planning perspective, this is one of the things where we really have seen that um, it takes a shift in mindset um, because again, during certain time frames, you're gonna have a, a lot of work to, to get accomplished. And so being able to understand how many acres you have to get across during tight time frames, and then also coupling that with understanding how many workable days you're actually are farmable days you're going to have during a specific month on average uh, is really important um, and then you can pressure check do I have the capacity both from a uh, equipment and labor perspective to get all that done within shorter time windows so you might look like you have a month but if you typically only have 15 farmable days during that month really you only have 15 days and then coming back to saying, all right, if I don't have that capacity, what do I want to do? Uh, you can either adjust your rotation to, as Pete mentioned, integrate other crops like small grains or things of that nature where some of the activities are going to be at different times in the crop year, or you have to add in additional labor and equipment. And that's where the, the process really becomes an iterative process, both in transition and in your organic rotation and continuing to go back and and rethink and refine your process to make sure that um, you have the capacity to make sure you're getting the most out of the opportunity and also not creating challenges for future years uh, by not getting the right work done at the right time. So we talked earlier about uh, managing weeds and, and different strategies. Um, we've laid out two, um, I guess, scenarios or growth patterns to me. As you look at table one, um, those are what I would consider your traditional farming implements uh, your grandfather had on the farm. Uh, they are sized and scaled though to your operations. So when you think about what is it going to take for me to get into organics and be successful, um, that rotary hoe, that cultivator, that harrow, relatively easy to find on farm sales or, or purchase outright if you're wanting to go that route. Um, those are the essentials. Now, as you start and get further into your organic career, um, it's not uncommon to move and get items from table two. Um, certainly, they have a, a higher level of refinement and, and could have specific needs and specific years that are very valuable, um, but they're not essentials if you're going to get started. Um, I kind of liken it to anyone who's ever played golf. Um, table one is your starter set. That's your basic driver, your putter, a wedge, and a couple of irons. 
as you get better at golf, then you tend to look at that full set with a sand wedge, with a, um, a hybrid wood, with a fuller set of irons. Um, so you can definitely go into organics with either one of these. However, with table one, you're seeing a very low cost of entry. And when you think about the return on investment or the ability to use those tools within a budget, be able to justify and pay for, I think that's a lot better situation to be in than being in table two, where you go out and buy a flamer for $20,000. And because the weather conditions or the situation isn't right, you're not using it effectively or enough, then it's just overhead. And, and that tends to tighten up the budget and then that tends to cause some issues too. So it's been our experience that, that starting at that basic level and then I guess you'd say with disposable money, looking at those other items uh, in that way. So there again, as we've, we've kind of talked around different ways uh, in the transition period to get to organics, uh, we know that there are certain crops that have value in transition beyond just the market value. So when you think about transitioning with that year three or that organic year in mind, let's say organic corn, rotation number one with two years of alfalfa from an agronomic point of view is certainly one of, if not the best option, knowing that once you plant that alfalfa, you're, you're harvesting on regular time frames, so you're wiping out those weeds, you're getting cover out there, you're providing nitrogen, you're breaking up compaction with that alfalfa root. Plus the fact, relatively speaking, it's a low management crop. You're not babysitting that crop to get it in at a, at a perfect time or, or cultivate at the perfect time or be able to harvest at the perfect time. So looking at your overall structure, I think most people need to be looking strongly at an alfalfa, alfalfa or a cereal grain, you know, seeded with alfalfa to start with. Um, that second rotation of wheat and peas, depending upon your geography, uh, could be very uh, a good way to go as well. Um, coming in after that crop of um, year one or prior to year one transition, prior to year one's transition year, planting winter wheat and then harvesting that wheat, putting a cover crop on the next year coming in with peas. Um, you look at the corn and soybean one, um, the thing that jumps out to me, first of all, is that you do have a higher investment to start with and that you're gonna have an awful lot of management. Um, if you're scaling in at the appropriate level into organics, and you're gonna jump in the first year with 500 acres of transitional corn and 500 acres of transitional beans, going back to that um, uh, work grid that was uh, shown earlier, you're gonna have an awful lot of time in the field, an awful lot of management time, and uh, you're gonna be basically drinking from the fire hose getting started takes an awful lot of management, we found, just even to hold dollars together. It can be done, but it's, it's certainly more challenging and can be exhausting. And then looking at that uh, final rotation of, of wheat and alfalfa, you know, there again, you're shifting weeds, you're shifting um, management. So there is no perfect transition cropping system. There are things that will probably work better in your situation. Um, there are things that probably are not the things you want to look at, at least on a large scale, in your operation um, going forward to that um, organic year. So it's important to game plan things out, to script things out, to put the rotation out and, and put that budget, that five and um, three year budgets together so that you can see how your transition years with that organic year or maybe even getting to year five with organics and blending that over the five years uh, would make a difference in your operation. I mentioned earlier, we are not crop insurance agents, uh, but we do recognize there's ways of managing risk. We've talked a lot about using cropping systems to manage risk. Um, there are things to consider as you are looking at um, traditional corn and soybeans as transition crops. And probably the big thing is that for most farmers, you're gonna go backwards to a, to a much lower T yield. And with your level of coverage, you're gonna have less coverage than most farmers are used to. 
So that has to factor into the business decision of how do we go ahead and, and do transition effectively? Um, certainly if you're historically in a situation where you're not farming for crop insurance, then maybe transitioning with row crops is a, is a favorable way to go. Uh, but we also know that that carries a lot more risk and each person has to decide how much risk they can handle. So when we look at the people that tend to be more successful, um, they tend to manage that risk both with insurance and with rotation. Um, one thing I would say too is that uh, I mentioned that uh, prevent planning situation um, a year ago or two years ago. It was a gift horse for people who had considered organic uh, because if you are in a situation where your crop insurance coverage was for conventional and you can justify that with your agent, um, you were able to do a transition year very easily and then leaving just one transition year um, ahead of that organic year. But that's the perfect storm of having everything come right together. Um, for most people, they certainly do need to make sure Yes, there's a good opportunity at year three for organics, but we got to make sure we get there as well. So we talked about a lot of things and, and how they tend to come together. Um, I think one of the big challenges that farmers have is um, they understand the agronomy, um, they understand the, the tillage and the timing and, and the planning and the rotation, it's gathering that information and paperwork to be a real challenge. And then once we gather it, how do we put it into a format that's good for certification? And, and that's where the My Farm platform from AgriSecure comes in. All those passes through the field are scripted. Those are required for certif certification within the organic world. You'll need them for both transition and organic. While we're capturing that information for government purposes, we're also using it for financial planning and tracking on the farm. And with all that information, we can also use it to make better decisions as well and document that information. And having that documentation is also important in organics because when you sign up for the organic program within the government, you allow the government permission to come into your operation and for up to five years, they can look at records of your a uh, cropping system and your documentation on, on what you've done. So you've got to have a way to manage and sort and handle all that information. Uh, plus you're also giving permission to have an inspector stop by for a spot inspection. Um, you want to have all that information in a, in a very good spot other than a shoebox and have it professionally put together so that when there's a question asked, we can answer it very easily. And that's what the My Farm program and platform does. It makes it very easy for farmers, especially those that aren't computer savvy, to manage that information so it doesn't become overwhelming. So as we've talked about in kind of summary format, all the things going into that transition, um, there's a lot of things to consider. A lot of things tend to work together. Um, like I mentioned earlier, I think a lot of these come back to weed management. If we're doing our rotation right, if we're doing our crop plan right, if we've got the right equipment, if we've managed the fertility, um, if we've understood the agronomy, um, we're putting ourselves in a position then to have good things happen in terms of weed management. And typically then that becomes where good things happen in terms of organics as well. Um, at AgriSecure, we do provide a level of support in helping manage agronomy questions because best management practices are not likely the same ones and the same advice you're gonna be getting from your local co-op. Uh, they don't always work. Um, one other thing we do at, at AgriSecure, and it's really important I think during those transition years is to understand what markets are out there. Um, the market transparency of, of what crops are out there is, is not very easily found. Um, you're gonna have some people that'll will show up and, and ask about organics if they know you're farming. Um, and they may or may not be giving you that best or fair price or that best option. So within AgriSecure, being part of Farmers Business Network, we do have an organic uh, market advisor service available to help strategize and set up a plan for marketing 
during those transition and especially those organic years. Um, it's very simple to get together with, uh, with Don Clement at FBN. I think it's very valuable because the market price is so easily um, recovered in having better market information about market pricing. Um, for a lot of um, crops, you can have information about a market close by be the best of what you're gonna be able to do. Uh, if you can take grain out of the field, park it in a bin, get it up on wheels, you might be able to capture a much better bid, even though you're gonna be paying more in trucking to get that, so you're gonna have a higher net. It's and, to understand those uh, markets, especially if you when you get beyond the point of beans. And, and Pete, I'm gonna jump in. We had a question very early on. I think this is the right time to address it about, um, you know, what, and for corn and soybeans, uh, the question was, can you explain the opportunity, uh, the, the market price between feed grade and food grade, um, and what are the opportunities on each side? Um, so I don't know if you want to take a stab at that or if you want me to, to take a stab well, at it. I'll take a little bit of a stab at it. There, there is options out there. There are uh, contracts that are put forward by different um, entities that are looking for a, a quality trait or a aftermarket trait. Uh, could be anything from um, um, food grade, uh, conventional corn, it could be white corn, it could be purple corn for tortilla chips, it could be clear hylum soybeans. Um, end users typically will take a, a market price and add a premium in the form of a, a bump above and have a contract in place with different parameters to hit. Um, it can always be, you have to be aware there's there's always risk in trying to get more reward in that if market conditions or weather conditions don't cooperate and you don't hit that premium, what's your plan B? If, if you're looking at a conventional corn variety that has a food grade application, um, your fallback position may be just selling it as certified organic corn, not as a food grade certified organic. If you're dealing with something like a purple corn, for example, and you might have a really good contract, but for whatever reason, you don't make the grade there. Now, what's your fallback position there? It can be more difficult to move things. I'd say it's probably similar to what soybeans are too. And, and a lot of times to get that food grade premium, maybe from an agronomy um, point of view, you're gonna give up a few bushels to do that. That may or may not be a, an, an economic um, uh, calculation that favors going that route. There, there certainly are options out there, but it's certainly a buyer beware. And to me, that's one of those second level strategies too. Yeah, that's what I was going to add in, Pete. With, with many of our clients, when they're getting into organic, uh, we wouldn't recommend starting out with uh, food grade uh, contracts because it just we just don't have the history there to understand the potential to hit the quality specs that are required. Um, now, for those experienced organic farmers that uh, have a better feeling for what kind of production they'll get uh, in their field, um, you know, that's something that's certainly worth considering, especially if there's a, a more regional or local buyer who's interested in those crops. And, um, and if so, um, the big key piece is to, uh, one, assess your ability to hit the quality specifications they're needing, as Pete mentioned. And then what's your backup plan? And is your backup plan one where uh, it's still acceptable for you uh, from, a, from a revenue perspective? Um, especially since some of those crops may limit the varieties you can use or um, have other practices that could add additional uh, costs or lower yields in your operation. So as we, we kind of wrap things up, uh, we've talked a lot and I appreciate everybody's um, attentiveness and, and questions that have come forward. Uh, we've talked a lot about um, transitioning. Um, by no means though have we exhausted everything there is about transitioning and moving into organics. Um, I guess I know we have at AgriSecure uh, people and processes in place to make transition as professional and as timely and easy as we can, and also then setting you up for success within organics. Um, 
I think there's probably a lot of people that have thought about organics on, on the call today, the webinar. We sure appreciate uh, you learning more. Um, I think probably the biggest thing I look at is um, we may have started the conversation with why transition or why go into organics. Um, to me, it's very easy to answer that is that conventional farming has become a enterprise where we've outsourced all our management decisions to traits and technology. And then as a conventional farmer, we're surprised at the end of the season when there's no money left over after having paid for the technology and the seed and the chemistry for the variable rate application of fertilizer and the, the GPS and variable rate technology. People that I work with and, and what got me excited about getting back into organics is it gives me an opportunity to flex that management muscle and accept the results both good and bad for management decisions. So when I talk to so many farmers and, and especially larger farmers, they feel that things are kind of out of control, that they don't have the ability to impact their, their family's um, trajectory financially or trajectory in terms of, of keeping people or bringing people back onto the farm. When they move towards organic production, they can be overwhelmed with the amount of decisions from time to time, but they also recognize that opportunity is there for them to get a return on that management and get it before they give it away to anybody else. And that's really empowering to a farmer or to any person for that matter. So I think that's an important part to think uh, through as you're continuing your process of thinking about organic production and what it would mean on your farm. Thank you, Pete. And we're gonna move to the Q&A. Um, we have a number of questions that have come in through the chat or through the Q&A dialogue. So continue to ask those, um, but also feel free to take yourself off mute if you want to ask a question uh, directly. Uh, uh, directly. So w one of the first questions um, here was, what seed treatment options are available for disease and insect protection? Um, yep, there, there are options that are out there. Um, most seed companies that have um, that are working within the organic space um, have uh, in their lineup a certified organic or compliant um, seed coating seed treatment. I will say that when we look at things like um, corn and soybeans, for example, uh, it is always good if you've got the ability to manage risk of pest and there is a treatment option available, take advantage of it. However, when you think about what the seed coatings traditionally have done, it's allowed farmers to plant earlier and earlier in conditions that are tougher and tougher without losing that stand or that vigor. More often than not, though, when we're in organic, we're operating in a different time. So as you think about planting corn, for example, if you're conventional corn planting, you'll start the 15th of April in most of Iowa. Conditions can be really tough for that time frame. If on the other hand, you're organic and you're planting corn, your most likely planting date is gonna be in that last week of May, first week of June. Weather conditions and soil conditions are very different at that point than they were six weeks earlier. So seed coatings in and of themselves, I tend to feel, and I think most people in organic tend to be valued less for that reason. So they're not as essential as they are in conventional farming. And, and Pete, I apologize, I was multitasking by looking at other questions, but mm -hmm. did you also touch upon the fact that with rotations being more diverse, some of those disease cycles get broken up so they're not as, as predominant or a, a, a big issue in, in organic rotations versus some of their conventional counterparts? I did not, but that is an excellent point. All right, perfect. Uh, the next question was thoughts on 60 inch corn and living cover, I assume in the alleys, um, lots of interest from livestock operations. Okay. Uh, limited experience right now. Um, I have got a couple of uh, clients that I work with that are doing corn in 60 inch rows. Let me back things up a little bit. The, the, the row spacing in and of itself um, has to be managed to the crop you're looking at. So when you think about what we're trying to do, we're trying to capture sunlight. 
and, and using that plant to capture sunlight, convert it into a sugar that we can go ahead and, and have that fruit, whether it's a seed bean or a corn plant traditionally, in a marketed situation. There are farmers out there that are going 15 inch road conventional in both corn and, and soybeans. They may or may not be capturing any more light. They're planting at say 36, 37,000 plants per acre. You can do the same thing in a 60 inch row and have more space to get more sunlight. Myself on my farm, for a couple other reasons, but I'm in 36 inch rows. Um, my experience with other um, jobs that I've had is that row spacing in and of itself isn't the end all be all for yield. There are some advantages to going to a wider row, especially if you're able to graze that center. Um, to me, that would still be a second level sort of a, um, a conversation, but if you're in a situation where you're experienced with livestock, whether it's cattle or sheep or goats, um, that may be something that would go quicker. Um, one of my customers um, that had 60 inch rows this year, uh, I went out and looked at his field prior to harvest, talked with him about his yield. Um, I would have to say his yield was comparable, if not maybe a little bit less than in his 30 inch rows. So it, it's not that it can't happen, that you can get very good yields. And especially if you're looking at it from a point of view of um, also having a second um, stream of activity and income, um, I think it is uh, something that can work very well, but that is a second level. So start slow, start on a small scale, do your homework with it before you jump in and do everything that way. So real quick, before I go on to the next question, do want to encourage others to ask questions. Feel free to take yourself off mute or put them in the Q&A or the chat box. Um, we had a question about, how, about spray drift from neighboring farms. Um, in terms of, of, of managing operations within the, the structure of your organic field, um, and I'm thinking about spray drift primarily during the organic year, you, you do have buffers that are um, put together so that you mitigate as much of that pollen drift and potentially spray drift as you can. Every situation is different. Um, we have had situations where the wind has redeposited herbicide into a field that is a certified organic or will be an organic or even a transition field. At AgriSecure, we think it's extremely important to be upfront, transparent, and black and white with everybody in this process. Um, we see there's issues that develop when people try to skirt around things. So we encourage everybody, if there is a situation where they do have a contamination of their field of their own or of someone else's uh, activity, that we disclose that right away. And what we find is when we disclose things right away, we can get issues resolved in, in that situation. Um, I typically what can happen is if you're talking about a herbicide that does not have a soil residual component, or typically then a, a residual component that would be traceable into the grain, that certification companies will work with you to either segregate that crop year or have that um, put into a buffer or not used in the organic chain, but not jeopardize future um, organic operations on that farm. There again, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to be transparent, be proactive and upfront with your certification companies and your certification agents and disclose those when they happen so that they can be addressed, addressed early. And what I'd add to that is that we also really recommend being as proactive as possible in terms of trying to mitigate those situations. And so the ways that you can do that um, are there's a driftwatch.org website where you can register your fields uh, as being organic or transition so that, and those are supposed to be referenced by uh, people before they spray uh, on other fields. Two, you can post signs, and we have everybody post signage uh, on their fields that are organic in transition. Uh, that's clear and makes known that uh, they shouldn't be sprayed with chemical uh, and make others around them aware uh, 
to be to try to raise awareness and make sure that they're uh, spraying in the right conditions. And then the other piece is having discussions with the neighbors who own those farms around yours or those fields around yours to make sure they're aware of if you're growing an organic crop or a transition crop uh, and requesting that you know they apply the the type of caution that is needed to minimize that spray drift. And then as Pete mentioned, you know, in situations where there is an adjoining field and there's no natural buffer, it is required that you have a buffer strip and that can help uh, in those situations as well. So it's being proactive on the up front side and as well as, you know, being proactive if, if those situations happen. Now we've been fortunate that we haven't seen uh, you know, an overwhelming amount of those situations. And when we have had those, uh, we've been able to work through it by being upfront and honest uh, and proactive with the certification agency in minimizing the impact for that crop year or future crop years. Um, another question came in, Pete. I want to start a, I want to start small and have five acres that have been in alfalfa for four years with no chemical and fertilizer used. I was thinking of doing a high value crops. Any suggestions? Hemp, yeah. question mark. Uh, I would plan on expanding to other acres as I learn the process. Great. Um, I think it's it's important to scale in at a, at a manageable level, uh, depending upon your objectives and your equipment and your time. Um, there are acres out there that I think most people are unaware. We call them hidden organic acres in that if you have an alfalfa field, for example, that has not had a chemistry application the previous 24 plus months, providing an affidavit stating that um, and having it accepted by the certification agency, that field this next year then could go into producing a certified organic crop. The same would be true of ground coming out of CRP. Um, pasture ground would be a very similar sort of scenario. So there are acres out there that can go right into organics if there is a documentation trail to show that there has not been a non-approved substance out there. Um, and while we kind of bring that up, I did want to mention one thing too. One of the questions that comes up from time to time is, how do I manage or who has a certification on a farm? And the answer is the farmer himself has the certification, not the landlord. And it's, it's a point of contention where um, some farmers are leery about getting into organics. And then once they do the hard work of transitioning, they may feel they could be undercut by somebody else um, in, in terms of a cash rent scenario. Um, if you have done the certification paperwork um, and somebody else would come into that farm, they have to provide documentation that the prior three years, nothing has gone onto that farm. Since you are the farm tenant at that time, you're the only person that could provide that information. So whether you would choose to, or whether you would choose not to, you're in control of that acre. If that acre goes back to the landlord, somebody else coming in starting the 1st of March, the 1st of March would be that date they were in possession of management on that farm. So that would be the starting point for that transition clock. So then in thinking about the, the rest of that question of uh, how do I get started or what crops there are there, um, typically what we find when we come out of uh, things like CRP and, and somewhat pasture, we need to kind of kickstart biology. So it can be kind of challenging that first year to get everything to work right. Uh, some crops like corn tend to do better than, than other crops. Um, in terms of high value crops, um, depending upon your abilities, there may be an option with a uh, farm to market, sort of an organic um, potato or carrot or squash or, or something else. Um, but typically, we tend to specialize at AgriSecure in, in broad acre crops. And, and let me jump in. So a few thoughts here. If you're thinking about expanding your operation over time, uh, I would consider what are the crops that you think you can scale up. And so, um, you know, for us, the crops that we've seen uh, be very scalable are uh, the, you know, organic corn, organic soybeans, uh, wheat, you know, the small grains, things of that nature. 
uh, because that will give you a learning opportunity, even though it's on a smaller set of acres, to learn your organic production system on a small set of acres um, and then be ready to scale it up over time and things and crops that you think you can scale. Specifically related to hemp, we've had uh, many of our clients ask about hemp. We've been cautious in terms of jumping into the market uh, for several reasons. One, from our analysis, uh, there's quite a bit of genetic variation uh, or the, the genetics um, on hemp. Um, you know, there's just a lot of unknowns from a, a growing practices perspective. Two, there's been some market volatility in terms of demand and pricing and counterparty risk. Uh, and then if you're getting into CBD hemp, that's an area that we don't know a lot about, but it is extremely labor intensive. Um, and so that's something that um, uh, I would be, it would just be cautious to understand what are the requirements, how do I hit those specifications, what happens if my hemp goes hot, uh, meaning that the THC levels exceed what's uh, uh, allowed, uh, because in that case you are required to destroy the crop. Um, so there's a lot of uh, a lot of different intricacies that are involved with hemp that uh, we're not necessarily the the right group to to help support right now. We're learning and we're investigating and trying to understand. Um, and then in terms of non-CBD uh, uses of hemp, I know there's a lot of development in that space. Um, and that's evolving. I think there's some promise there for the future, but uh, we don't feel like right now that's the place to start or jump in. So um, the other thing around starting small, uh, many of our clients and our founders even started small and afterwards um, kind of kicked themselves in the butt uh, for two reasons. One, when they got to that organic year, uh, and they saw the returns on their fields relative to conventional fields, they'd wish they'd put more into organic sooner or into transition sooner. The second was that the experience of going small, it was really hard for them to understand how they could scale up, right? Uh, so small that it didn't provide a good example of what could they manage uh, as they scaled production up. And they made some investments in equipment to manage those fields, and they realized that they weren't getting uh, the return on that investment that they could have that they'd done more more acres uh, right off the bat. Um, so those are just some considerations that um, you might want to have. And of course, on that question, on any of the questions, if anybody wants to follow up with us later, feel free to reach out. Uh, you can email contact at agrosecure.com or call us and mention you're on the webinar and we'll make sure to to follow up and you know, have a good discussion getting into your specific situation. There's another question. Uh, I am in transition with three years of alfalfa. Last year uh, was my first year of alfalfa, but there's a weevil issue that killed their stand, weevil worms. So he's going to replant. Are there any treatments or applications that can kill the worms uh, so it doesn't happen again? Um, that's a great question. Pete, I don't know the answer to that, but I am going to be talking to Matt. Um, it, actually right after this call. So uh, Matt Holman is, uh, works with one of our co-founders who happens to have about 6,000 acres of organic health alpha. Um, so Aaron, I can ask Matt afterwards, and I believe I have your email address from your registration. So I can follow up with you um, later today on that. So I apologize for not knowing the answer to that question, but we can certainly follow up. One thing I would say, Steve, is that there are products out there that are approved for organic operations. Uh, there's a common fungicide called Regalia. Um, there are two insecticides, Pyganic and uh, Prosinic, that are out there as well. So as I understand all those products, they are, are older chemistries, more naturally derived, um, they are more narrow spectrum, um, but they can be very effective if you've got a single pest issue. So there are some placement uh, guides for using all those products, but know that there are some products out there that are available to manage those in-season issues with leaf diseases or with um, bugs. 
and, and certainly on the fertility side, there's a number of products um, that are out there. Um, products that are certified as organic. There are also, if you're in a situation where it's unsure whether a product is certified organic, um, you are also able to partition or petition the certifying agency to evaluate whether that product complies with the NOPS or not. So just because it doesn't have a certification designation doesn't mean that it would not be approved for applying it to an organic crop. Um, you know, and yeah, there, there's, there's just a lot of things as you, you kind of go through organics that can be points of um, a good turn or a bad turn going forward. Um, there are things that people will present as natural um, that are not certified organic. And, and it's important to have a ruling on those as soon as possible or not use those products in your rotation, in your seed treatment, in your manure source as a pit activator, or adjuvant, or any kind of an additive into um, something that gets applied into that field. So we try to work with farmers to make sure before we get started that they haven't shot themselves in the foot with one of these products. Um, but from time to time, it unfortunately does happen. So another question came in, what would be the optimal lease length for land going into transition to organics? Interesting question. I think the, uh, the kind of minimum that I would look at if I were farming and was working with a landowner in transition um, I would look at that five-year lease because you're going to have two years of transition and then three years of having an organic crop. Um, I think that would vary, though, based on the landowner's objective, whether it is to cash out and make as much money, or there are landowners out there who are very stewardship-minded, who are looking at... Um, this asset that they have, this piece of ground, and that are very much excited and wanting to have people farm it organically. Um, but if you're just looking at a typical farm lease, in order to recoup the value of those first two lean years, I'd really have to think about a four, if not a five year lease to make sure that I covered myself for those initial transition years. And a few other considerations. So if you've worked that land before or you held the lease uh, for this crop year, that's fantastic because you know when the last application date was of a prohibited substance. Um, and you know that going back to that initial slide, when, when, um, when it starts, if you're taking over a new lease, one of the things that you would want to make sure that as a part of that is that you understand when the, uh, uh, the last prohibited substance was applied so that nothing post-harvest, including you know any sort of synthetic fertility that was put down because that could extend the transition period uh, uh, further for uh, three crop years and that you'll be able to get access to an affidavit uh, from whoever was managing that land stating what the last product was applied and when it was applied to be a part of uh, your initial certification records that you provide. So just another consideration when entering into land, lease, land leases on land that you haven't managed previously. Any additional questions? I, do, I think we've covered most of them. So. Uh, Thank you all. Really appreciate the time. Again, we're here to help. Our, our, our organization is entirely focused on helping farmers succeed at organic production. Um, and so if you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to reach out to us at contact at agrosecure.com. Uh, and I'll make sure that uh, an appropriate colleague or myself or Pete gets in touch with you. And again, we do have uh, a number of webinars coming up. Uh, on the 24th, we have Avoiding 
five, and I think it's actually expanded to seven in my last review, common pitfalls of organic transition. So we covered the basics. Now we're going to cover some of the things that we've seen folks trip up on uh, and create some more challenges. Then on December 1st, we're going to do a deep dive on organic weed management, five principles for long-term success. And then December 8th, we'll be talking about optimizing organic returns, uh, thinking through or rotations, execution and risk management and how they could either work together uh, or uh, at times work against each other if you don't have the system working as it should. So I hope you can join us for those. And again, feel free to reach out. We're here to help. Uh, thank you for the time and have a great day.